name is Jonathan Paley. I'm a resident physician at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, and I'm, I'm very excited today to be introducing Dr. Bob Price, who is a physicist uh, and a teacher of mine here at, at Fox Chase, and really considered a one of, one of many pioneers, I think, in IMRT and especially the QA processes associated with it. You know, today's lecture is going to be focused on introducing some fundamental concepts and workflows, ideally, you know, more on the practical side of how we perform quality assurance for, for IMRT treatment. For tre IMRT treatment. Uh, the, the following lectures, which we'll talk about again at the end, are going to be on Thursday, but we're going to be having some additional physicists join us in addition to, to Dr. Price, and we're going to talk about your questions, your workflows, and, and kind of bounce around ideas for you know, alternative ways of doing things as, as, as the conversation takes us there. And then next week, Dr. Diederich will be talking a little bit more about specifics of patient-specific QA and how, how she does that maybe with a slightly different perspective. So I encourage, we very much encourage people to ask questions. If you want to type them into the chat box, I can help relay them to Dr. Price during the during the session or at a break when appropriate or at the end. But then keep in mind that on Thursday, we're primarily going to be having a kind of a discussion and Q&A session. So if you have longer questions or additional questions, that'll be a great time to ask them during a kind of a less structured period where we don't have a formal lecture at that time. So again, I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Price and uh, thank you again for, for being with us today. Okay, good morning or afternoon to everyone. I'm very honored to be here and I'm very happy to see many people interested in IMRT. I'm going to talk a little bit about the QA process for IMRT. Just to give you an idea, we started IMRT in 1999, actually, and we are right at about 13,000 patients right now. So a great deal of change has been experienced over that amount of time. And um, I'm going to try to express some of the things that we've encountered and some of the equipment types of things that will hope, hopefully benefit you. So for an outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about the need for patient-specific IMRT QA, delivery QA, a general uh, overview of how it's done commonly, a progression of methods based on the type of equipment or resources you may or may not have, and then the current recommendations from the AAPM. So why should we perform patient-specific IMRT QA in the first place? So this is a very simple concept here for a 3D case. Basically, we trust our broad beam data. We know that if we have, say, a 10 by 10 field, anterior to posterior projection, we know the dose distribution is going to be fine based on our normal scans. We typically will do monitor unit calculation to make sure, every, along with reviewing the chart, making sure everything is fine. We're basically, we're just taking the monitor units equals the dose divided by all the correction factors. And does this agree with the treatment planning system? We can even do this for things like shaped beams, as you see over here. This is routine throughout the world. For IMRT, it gets a little bit more complex. As you can see here, this was a very early prostate case and just the right lateral field had 13 segments. So we're no longer in the broad beam concept. We no longer are comfortable enough, for one, with the dose distribution that will be generated from all of these small leaf sequences. Additionally, doing a hand calculation or even a, using a program we typically use dose to a point. We're not going to get any spatial information whatsoever with this. So we need some way in which to make ourselves feel comfortable that what we see is what we get, basically. So that need is exactly that for patient-specific delivery QA. We need to assure that we can deliver the dose distribution we've generated with the treatment planning system within acceptable limits. So this is where this method comes from. The general overview of how it's commonly done. I like to call this an inference method. A patient plan is found to be acceptable by your radiation oncologist. The leaf sequences and monitor units for that plan are delivered to a virtual phantom and the distribution obtained. So whatever phantom you're going to irradiate with whatever detectors or detector array or film or whatever you're going to use to measure the radiation embedded is CT scanned and imported into your planning system. Then the patient's plan, the acceptable plan, is delivered virtually within the planning system. Then you take the physical phantom and irradiate under the same conditions and you compare the two. 
if they match or they're comparable, we can infer that the actual patient plan will be acceptable when delivered to the patient. So this is basically a very simplistic way of looking at it. Here are some images. If we take the approved plan for the patient, as you can see here, the axial uh, chrono and sagittal distribution, and we create a virtual phantom. In this case, this is just a solid water phantom with an ion chamber array embedded. And we deliver the virtual phantom, the dose for, for the patient to that virtual phantom within the TPS. Then we take that same phantom system and irradiate it exactly like we're going to irradiate the patient. We can then evaluate the measured versus planned dose distributions and apply whatever tolerances we have come up with. All right, and then we can say, yes, this plan is deliverable to the patient or no, this plan is not deliverable to the patient. This is a good time to distinguish between IMRT commissioning and QA. I'm not sure if you've already had the commissioning talks, but patient specific phantom QA, IMRT deliver, delivery K, QA is exactly that. It only tests delivery, delivery accuracy, calculational accuracy. How does your planning system work when calculating in lung tissue interface, this kind of stuff. This is done during commissioning. Not, you're not gonna get this information from nightly delivery QA. So with that in mind, we can progress. One of the things that I've already mentioned is that you like to deliver in the same way the patient is going to deliver. Deliver to the phantom, the same way you're going to treat. We'll go over this in much more detail in a little while when we get to recommendations. But to me, it's always seemed intuitive, right? If you deliver all the beams straight down, one of the primary modes of failure might be the multi-leaf collimator positioning. But it seems to me that if gravity is normal to the direction of leaf travel, this will be less likely to occur than at all the other angles where you're putting stress on this mechanical system. Additionally, we often use non coplanar beam arrangements where we're not treating all axial beams. Here we have a cartoon with the patient on the support assembly or couch. Here's the machine. It rotates down, we wanna avoid this. So not only do we do this at nighttime when we do the actual phantom QA, but we perform a dry run with the patient on the treatment table for all non-coplanar patient or, or beam arrangements prior to the first treatment. So this allows this to be safe if we're going to use such an arrangement. So, <clears throat> so what are we checking? We're checking the electronic transfer, the planning system, to the record and verify system, to the LINAC. This is a true end-to-end -end test of delivery once we have an acceptable plan. The delivery accuracy. We have very demanding physicians and we have very innovative planners and they stress the system. So what, what I try to explain this is we commission the machine, the treatment planning system and delivery system here. Our, Physicians always want more than they can have, and the dosimetrists or physicists always try to give that to them so they may make plans outside of those limits that we've set. This is where we can sometimes run into issues with respect to plans not passing our predefined criteria. So I'm going to reemphasize throughout this talk that you need to evaluate your system as a function of time, as a function of changing treatment sites, treatment delivery techniques, whether it's VMAT, fixed beam, dynamic, non-coplanar arrangements, we're looking for systematic errors in the system at that point. So you need to uh, constantly be reviewing different things with respect to changing your environment. We're checking the most probable causes of failure. The multi-leaf collimator position, as I said, is one of them unknown attenuation, anything that you could potentially come through, and there's a multitude of other things. Potential collisions is very important. Do we ever find anything? The answer is yes. So here's a nice little example where we were looking at a VMAT or a rapid arc prostate case, and this is the coronal view measured here, calculated, and the dose overlay. What's this? This was approximately 25% out of the 80 grade delivered in a non-target region. And it was clearly evident on both. What this stems from, you can see it if you're looking for it. The problem is, is if we allow ourselves to just look at distilled values, okay, this passes or does not pass based on a specific number, we would miss this. In this case, we caught this and it's basically due for VMAT. We 
try to avoid having the MLC direction of travel be coincident with the gantry travel. This will exacerbate tongue and groove effects. So one of the common things is to rotate the collimator. And in this case, it was rotated 45 degrees. As you can see, the MLCs abutted inside the fixed jaw positions. This was due based on where they placed the isocenter. So the leaves are typically parked when they're not interacting with the, the dose is not projecting onto the prostate or whatever the target is outside of the jaws for the added attenuation. In this case, they were parked inside and on this ovarian accelerator, they have rounded leaf ends. So those rounded leaf ends, when they're abutting, produce about 25% transmission. And that's what you could clearly see. We tried to fix this in the planning system with the ISA center where it was, it was not. We were actually able to fix it in a record and verify system, but we made this go away prior to treatment. We didn't want to give 25% of the total dose outside the target region. So a progression of methods or the amount of information for analysis. Um, this is a good time to talk about this. We can use point dose measurements. This is where we started and we take a single ion chamber Typically, you place that ion chamber at, for measurement in the high dose, low gradient region, right? This is where we're interested, primarily in the target region. And we deliver all of the beams, as this cartoon uh, depicts. Uh, you want your phantom to preferably be water equivalent. It cuts down on the number of um, corrections you have to make. If you want additional points, you're going to need to radiate more than one time. You would have to reset up, move everything, put your chamber in a different position and irradiate and make assessment. This is very good because it shows you the magnitude of the dose. If you are planning for two gray per fraction and based on the size of your phantom, if you get four gray per fraction, then you know you're, you're way off, right? So we're looking at the magnitude of this type of error. This is not giving us any spatial information, but it is telling us are we in the right ballpark with respect to dose. I took time out here just to show this little concept, and this is way back in 2002. We looked at about the first 400 or so cases on three different machines, two different energy, all with small volume ion chamber measurements. And as a function of time, we looked at their variance from one, two, and three percent deviation with what was expected, and we had an arbitrary cutoff of 95 percent. As you can see here, 94 percent of them were within 3% variation in the first, first iteration. So this was very good. Anything outside of that would require us to evaluate. Okay. So in addition to this, once again, there's no spatial information here, but it shows a nice pattern of what we were doing. This was over multiple body sites. Probably back at that time, this would have been a GU or a prostate. It would have had some head and neck cases in there, uh, probably some abdominal cases as well. These were all fixed beam, no, I, no VMAT cases at that point. In order, if you don't have software to allow you to get spatial information, you could augment those ion chamber measurements with intensity pattern comparisons. Here you can see on the left is just a single beam projection of what the intensity leaf sequence would look like, what the intensity map would look like, not the leaf sequence. So the darker values, meaning more dose going through, the lighter uh, pixels, less dose. And then you can physically measure those. In this case, in film, you could use your EPID and lay them side by side. If your ion chamber measurements were good, this would give you a sense of some spatial information that would say, yes, if I have ion chamber measurements in one or two areas, perhaps this would be enough to make me feel good if all of the beams were irradiated. This is a qualitative assessment, though, in this case. This is just telling us, yes, this one looks like that one. Another way of doing and this was back in 2001, another way that we did this same kind of a concept was we looked at the calculated versus the measured axial dose distributions and a phantom. And we replaced the ion chamber plugs, if you want sleeves, with plugs of the same material, inserted film between each of the slices, and then applied clamps to reduce the air gaps. You re resulting here is the 
treatment planning system distribution and the measured distribution. And these are relative values. So you could lay them side by side. Once again, this was before we had software to do this for us. Does the one on the left look like the one on the right to within a reasonable um, degree? Now I'd like to say right here that it is recommended that we do everything in absolute dose mode now. This um, is very important just because we don't wanna miss, as I said earlier in the example, when you're planning for two gray, or you think you're planning for two gray, someone plans for four gray, and you could end up with very serious problems. But if we have the ion chamber measurements, then this is taking care of that aspect. We could simply look at the distributions in a manual manner and say, yes, we feel comfortable enough to treat. Again, this is a qualitative assessment. If we have an overlay, we can fuse those two images. In this case, it's a different, uh, a different picture. It may be qualitative or it may be quantitative. It requires software if it's quantitative. So here's an example of this where we take the measured distribution, the calculated distribution and overlay them or fuse them together and then perform some type of analysis. In this case, it's gamma analysis, which we'll talk about it in some depth here in a while. And you can see here the, the blue areas are passing. Our predefined uh, criteria of 3% dose, three millimeter distance to agreement and a 10% threshold. Red areas are failing. So about 99% of the pixels pass, which in general is a very good thing. So, and that was uh, the picture on the right is just showing the uh, coronal dose distribution from where this was derived. So this one will definitely be a quantitative assessment. Okay, so we have some consequences for substandard IMRT QA results. If it's very inefficient, if we don't get results that we, we feel are acceptable, we need to look at a lot of things, which I will go over a, a lot of things here in a moment. But one of the things may be just, just calculate a new plane of irradiation. You have to reanalyze or re-irradiate and reanalyze. This can cause some delays potentially depending on your patient load, how close you are to the treatment start when you were doing this delay. This along with their, your administration and your uh, physician's reluctance to delay treatment may lead to physicists approving substandard QA results, which is never ideal. So we wanna make sure that we have a reasonable understanding of things so that we can uh, do this properly. It's good to have an understanding of some of the reasons why something would fail. Many causes contribute to IMRT QA results. It could be the beam model, which others will be talking to you about in the commissioning talks. The detector plane select selection, as I mentioned before, it's preferable once we get through the commissioning process to evaluate plans in the high dose, low gradient region as a routine. There will be times when we do others as I'll, I'll speak about in a moment. Your resolution of your detector array. Obviously film will have the highest resolution, but this is why they build detector arrays. People don't wanna go through the uh, arduous film dosimetry. So we rely on interpolation now. Setup error, do we give correct instructions to the people who are doing the irradiation. At Fox Chase, the people who are doing the planning are not the people who are doing the irradiation, and they're not the people who are doing the analysis. So we, we think we have a nice system that is, we remove as much bias as possible, but everything has to work. Angular dependence, your system as a whole may have a dependence on the trajectory of the beams, not necessarily the individual detectors, but the system as a whole. You need to correct for beam output. You need, because the planning system always thinks you're irradiating one centigrade per monitor unit for a standard conditions where in reality, your Linux don't always run perfectly. Also the detector response needs to be checked each time. What about highly modulated beams? Does severe modulation correlate with IMRTQA delivery failure? Many have suggested that, that it does. There are publications that show that if you have a very severely modulated plan, it may result in worse QA results. I'm going to leave the beam model for now because I believe you're going to get this elsewhere and we're going to make the assumption that we're, we've made it through this point. We have a nice beam model for our area that we're going to 
generate plans and delivery. Outside of this, when we start looking at things that we did not commission our planning system to do, as we become more and more advanced, there are times when we may wish to revisit this. Um, detector plane selection is very important. As I said, the detector array resolution, we're going to rely primarily on interpolation. Setup errors, we're going to talk about, but I'll talk a little bit about the highly modulated plans as well. So routine detector plane selection. Here's a, a, a treatment plan where you see the axial, sagittal, and coronal distribution, and with no shift, meaning that we've just calculated the dose using the isocenter of the phantom and the isocenter of the, the actual patient being coincident, right? And now you can see the, the, the plane of the, the array. The only place we get information is wherever these little dots are. This corresponds to this array. In this case, there's a thousand and twenty ion chambers in this array. We get no distrib we get nothing here. We get nothing here. We can only measure this. So this is the high dose, low gradient region. This is where the target's going to primarily be. This is what we're interested in most of the time for routine measurements. If we adjust the table height and move the entire array, this way, we could see we'd be in a high dose, high gradient region. This may be important for certain aspects, not necessarily routine. We're going, we could run into vo volumetric effects with respect to our ion chamber. If we're not cognizant of what we're looking at, it will compound the issues with respect to how we're, how we're evaluating these plans. If we move it in the other region, where we're looking at the low dose in either a high or low gradient region, it may or may not be meaningful for us. We're not typically interested in this as our first order approximation. We're interested in the target. So as a, as a note, analysis and non-routine regions should be made during commissioning as well as each new body site or change in technique. When you go from coplanar to non-coplanar beam arrangements, when you go from when you go from fixed beam IMRT to VMAT, when you go from <laughs> I'm sorry, when you go from prostate to thorax to head and neck, whatever you're looking at, you should look at these as a function of plane selection as well. This will help you understand how your system is working over all different variables that you can. Multiple plane selection for delivery QA. So here's a, a, a plan that has axial, sagittal, coronal distribution. We're interested in the high dose region here. So I've outlined it in white and shown this would be the plane of isocenter. This would put us in the high, high gradient region, which we may or may not wish to look at. If we lower the couch one centimeter, now that same plane avoids that higher, higher gradient region, which may afford us some information. As I've said here, multi-plane analysis allows for increasing increased sampling within irregularly shaped targets. Unfortunately, most of our targets aren't little spheres. They, a lot of time, will look like this. The only way to set this phantom up is in one of the cardinal directions, whereas our target is actually along a diagonal like this. If we raise the couch, now we pull us into another region that may be beneficial. So, this is a, an area where we need to make sure that we give those that are irradiating the appropriate instructions. Here is that, that plane. The only issue with this is that re, they require multiple, for every plane you have to re-irradiate, you have to reset up and re-irradiate again. So it is time intensive. Before we move on, I know this is a very busy slide, but I wanted to talk a little bit about plan acceptance as a function of complexity or passing rate as a function of plan complexity. And I've defined plan complexity here in a very simple manner. I've called it the mod approximate modulation scaling factor. So if we have a very complex intensity map, varying intensities, this is going to require a complex leaf sequence, many small segments potentially. So as we all know, the smaller the segments, the higher the monitor units because of the lack of scatter. And we're using um, binary call MLCs, so we know that they're very, very inefficient. So the more complex intensity map will naturally result in more complex and more, more 
monarch units, if you will. So this is very, very important for us for many things, many reasons. Some, some have advocated that this will result in lower passing rates. We need to worry about efficiency, time on the table. We need to worry about shielding. These are all different things that we know and will have to be evaluated. So what I've done here is I've said 3%, 3 millimeters, 10% uh, threshold, as well as as we get to APM TG218, they're, they're suggesting 3%, 2 millimeters, 10% threshold. So I took, in this case, 75 IMRT cases and evaluated them at 3%. That's what they were already evaluated as, as a function of the mod, modified modulation scaling factor. And you can see here that we had very low correlation, even though there's a small drop in passing rate, nothing's really significant. As we went to the tighter and tighter criteria, 3%, 2 millimeters, and here I just put in plus or the mean value for a modulation scaling factor, plus or minus one standard deviation, just so to demarcate this graph, we had little, if any, correlation. What this means is that basically the plans that had the high, high modulation, the plans low modulation, no difference in passing rate. So for our individual system, our planning system clear through the QA process, we don't necessarily find a correlation with complex plans and IMRT failure rates. We redid the same test with VMAT, okay? And as you can see, little to no correlation or little if any correlation at all at either 3% 3 millimeter or 3% 2 millimeter. One of the things that is interesting is if we go back one, that for all of these 75 IMRT cases, you can see that the um, mean modulation scaling factor was about mm, probably about 4.3, meaning in order to deliver 100 monarch units or 100 centigrade, you need to deliver 430 monarch units. VMAT is significantly less, 3.2. Okay, so you will find these types of things out. This will help you in shielding calculations as well. But you should also evaluate these types of things. As I was saying, just because our system doesn't show this effect, others have seen this. So when you're evaluating all your prostates, all your head and necks, all your non coplanar arrangements, this is one of the things to be looking at. If all of a sudden you get failures or a, se a series of failures, what is the difference? What, if my here I have a VMAT plan series of them that has a mean of three, but as you can see here, I have a modulation scaling factor, some amount to five. If you're starting to see seven, eight, nine, something like this, that might be an outlier for you. Why is that plan so highly modulated? Maybe this has something to do with failure. So that this is one of the reasons why it's a, it's a good idea to evaluate your, your entire system as a function of change. Okay, so back in 2013, looks like I must have had some, a lot of time on my hands because I evaluated the first 2,500 patients that were QA'd with a multi-chamber array. And once again, this is a good idea to do, so looking for systematic errors. And you can see here about 65% of them were immediately 95% passing or better. And 95% passing rate was arbitrary. We still evaluate, what it meant for us is if it was 95%, or better, we could go directly to QA or go directly to treatment. No further work needed to be done. Anything outside of 95 needed further assessment. Doesn't mean we can't pass them. You can see here 35% of these, these are all acceptable plans, but we needed to do more work, whether or not that was additional planes. We need to be able to ex explain this. That being said, even within the 95% or above passing, if we saw deviations, from what was expected. If this was a head and neck case and I'm expecting all the time with VMAT to be 98 and I get a 96, well, then we're evaluating why was this plan outside the norm, this kind of thing, even though it was in the passing rate in the first place. So here are the ones that required further assessment right out of the gate. And one of the interesting things to note here is you can clearly see that as a function of time, right, we are getting more big, more and more passing. This is getting more dense, this is getting more sparse. This is probably attributable to us selecting better planes at the time, better instructions, learning, if you will, how we're going about this process and many things you will come across like this. There are other possibilities besides measurement 
and they've been published. They can be independent computer calculations, checksum approaches, log file analysis. I'm always reluctant to use just computer calculations because they don't assess delivery, but we may do a bunch of different things. Here's one that would not have been caught, caught. This is our same problem that we had, Donnie. This is with a head and neck tonsillar region, and you can see outside the target region, clearly we have some kind of discord. And what we've seen is the MLCs again being parked in the wrong place. This is clearly from an offset ISA center and, and a jaw setting issue. We went back in, replanned with the appropriate parameters, and those areas of high dose outside the target region went away. If this was a log file approach where you simply uh, deliver and the log file says, yes, I'm in agreement or disagreement with what the planning system said, this may not have been caught because everything would have said, yes, it, it was clearly here in the, in the planning section or, or aspect. I would have just skipped right over this because everything would have uh, been approved. So it is nice, to, it is arduous to do this work, but it is nice to find when you find errors and to avoid them. So amount of information for analysis. We have the ion chamber measurements, uh, or so I'm saying ion chamber in general. I guess it could be diode, we used ion chamber. You could have an ion chamber measurement. This is gonna give us the, the magnitude of the dose, right, right? And a fluence pattern comparison or ion chamber measurement with dose overlay. This will give us some spatial information as well. Then we can also have ion chamber or diode array or film measurements with no singular chamber um, measurements. As long as we can do this in absolute dose mode, we get dose as well as spatial information all at once. And then there are the ones that we can use log files and recalculate the dose or we can use images. Um, theoretically, there's been papers there where we can use the images from the EPID and recalculate the dose and place it back on the initial treatment planning scan. So this way it would allow for the physician to help, it would cost them more work, but help us determine pass, pass or failure of a plan based on actual anatomic correlation with dose which I'm putting as, as the highest amount of information that we can get for right now. So some practical steps to follow for failing delivery results. Check the delivery instructions versus the record and verified delivery re record. ISA center placements and the shifts. When they're done at, in the evening, you can look in your record and verify and see where the couch was. If you said raise the couch to center, meters and the couch was not raised, you know you have a discord between the plane exported and the one irradiated. So this is a common type of thing. Check the selection of the plane, the phantom plane irradiation in the treatment planning system. Was it in the high or low dose gradient region? Was the correct one exported? This is another place to be cognizant of. Check for unwanted attenuation like portions of the couch, metal, metal of any kind, support assembly bars, this kind of thing. Things that should not be in the way but potentially could have been during the analysis. Um, evaluate the time for output measurement, okay? And patient measurement. If you're using an ion chamber based array or ion chambers straight up, then you're going to be susceptible to temperature corrections. So if you're like us, we do our radiations in the evening and we sometimes do many. A couple of nights ago, there were 11. So it takes some time. It's good practice to take a new output reading periodically and don't require, don't rely on one to be applicable three hours later. So you, I have an example of this. And then check for in, inordinately small or many segments res, with respect to your routine practice. This means as a function of plan complexity, even though we did not show this, others have. So if you're routinely getting, that's why I mentioned, if you're routinely getting modulation scaling factor of three and you started getting six and sevens, this could tell you got a more of a complex uh, plan and you should be evaluating this. Check the delivery instructions. This is the, the example I had. So here we have uh, axial, coronal, and sagittal distribution where it was placed at the, the beams were placed virtually at the ISA center of the phantom. For some reason, we've decided to move the plane of calculation, a plane of assessment here by this much. 
for our Eclipse planning system and our, our Linux setup, this is the coordinate system that we use. So if we view from the foot of the couch facing the gantry, we can say prior to sequence irradiation, move the couch in, Z, Z in three centimeters, write four centimeters and raise the couch up three and a half centimeters. So this exact sentence would be um, conveyed to the folks that are doing the irradiations, knowing that they're to make these shifts, viewing from the foot of the couch towards the gantry. So depending on how your therapist, we try to keep it similar to what we do with the therapist, you just have to be cognizant based on your practices. If you get these backwards, then you'll get the wrong, wrong plane for analysis and it could cause treatment delays. As I mentioned, you could evaluate the time for output measurement and patient measurement. For significant differences, evaluate the temperature and pressure if they are available because you may need to correct the output specifically for ion chambers. So in this case, I just made up an example here where they take the 10 by 10 radiation at six o'clock in the evening. And then they do case one, case two. By the time they get to case five, let's say it's seven o'clock. Depending on your heating and air conditioning, the temperature in the vault can increase or decrease. Your phantom software may record this. Uh, so we may need to adjust that output accordingly for the actual patient. The one, or in this case, irradiated at seven o'clock. So here's an example where this was recorded and it says for the patient, it had a temperature of 23.5 degrees Celsius and 101, uh, 1,010 millibars for pressure. So if we assumed in this case that we had a, a one centigrade per monitor to unit output for the 10 by 10 at six o'clock and a temperature of 21 degrees, by the time we got to seven o'clock, it was 23 and a half degrees. Now, if we're using 3% two millimeter or 3% or 3% three, three millimeter window for radiation and we're already almost a full percent difference than this, this could cause us to have undue tight acceptance criteria. So basically this is just changing the patient's output by the initial output times the ratio of the temperature pressure correction factors. So we've done this, but a better way to actually do it is to do the 10 by 10 here, maybe do another 10 by 10 here, maybe when we get up, it just takes more time. But many times we'll get two, but often I have to make this type of correction. What you're doing is you're making the assumption that the machine output is stable, that you're not having a big variance in output, and that the chamber response is what's changing with temperature and pressure. So, current recommendations, excuse me, <clears throat> from APM TG Task Group Report 218, they've written a, a very nice report called Tolerance Limits and Methodologies for IMRT Measurement-Based Verification, QA. So this, this report is a great reference because it does show all the different ways to do things, things to look for, what the current recommendations for tolerances are, it gives great references for you to look up additional information. It's a, a nice general recommendation was put out in 2018. So they had different charges. They said they were supposed to review the literature and reports for agreement, measured versus calculated agreement. They wanted to look at how we measure. Do we measure QA just like the patient's being treated? Do we measure with all the beams pointed straight down? Do we make a composite of all of those? What are the pros and cons of these? Should we use a single point like that ion chamber? Should we use one or two D analysis? And should one of those to invest, and they wanted them to investigate the dose difference method, the distance to agreement method, and the gamma uh, verification metrics and give us some kind of criteria what would be acceptable for us to uh, for us to use as passing rates so they go through and they tell us uh, in this protocol a bunch of sources of error and the treatment planning system as you can imagine we have the mlc leaf ends the tongue and groove effects small fields output factors many other things how we did our profiles during machine commissioning so there are many, many different things that need to be ironed out when we're building our beam models. For the delivery systems, we can have uh, random and systematic leaf position errors. We can have leaf speed errors if we're using um, dynamic delivery. We can have gantry rotation stability. 
is our machine stable with respect to flatness, symmetry, or output, dose rate, all of these types of things, and very, very small monitor units. I actually think this is very important and with respect to how we evaluate things. I inspected a center once that was using 5%, 5 millimeters distance to agreement. And I said, why are you using such a large window? And they implied that because they couldn't get them to pass the 3%, 3 millimeters, so this is what was being presented to the physicians. I said, no, this is not what the intent is. That means that your accelerator is unable to deliver this complex of a treatment. You need to, they had two accelerators. You need to transfer these patients to the machine that can pass these criteria and limit the less stable, less accurate machine to simpler treatments. So this does give us a lot of tools, but we just have to be cognizant of why we're doing this work and I think if we go back to one of the early slides where I said we want to assure ourselves that what we're delivering is what we told the physicians, what we planned on the planning system, that those two coincide. All right. So there's some challenges for comparing dose distributions, and these in include gradients and misalignments. So if we look at the dose difference test, this was an initial test. This was excellent in the low dose gradient regions where dose changes slowly with location. But it's in a steep gradient regions, even large errors will result in effectively moving the dose only a short distance. So it's not necessarily a robust test for what we need. The distance to agreement test is ideal for determining the separation between steep dose gradient regions, but becomes, becomes oversensitive in the low gradient regions. So with all of this known, back in, I wanna say it was, it was, it was before this, uh, quite a bit of time, Dr. Lowe and his group came up with what they called the gamma test. And I, I've extracted this image from a, a later paper just because I've always liked this image. It gives you kind of a nice idea of how this actually works. So what we have here is we have a, a reference point, a dose point here, and one that we're going to make comparisons with. This would be our measured, this would be our calculated. And we can look at the difference in distance and the difference in dose. And if we set up our tolerances here, how much we will allow dose difference, say 3%, what's our distance to agreement, three millimeters, along with where we've evaluated. And if we set a passing, what this is called, is called the quality index, has to be based on this equation less than one. You can clearly see that these are just the squares of those difference, uh, differences divided by the squares of the um, tolerances, take the square root of the whole thing. Neither, both of them cannot be one, obviously, or we're outside of our criteria. One of them can be one and one of them can be zero, but other than that, in order to meet these criteria and have less than one, so we're acceptable, greater than one, we're not acceptable, these both need to be less than one. So the problem is with this, this is a, a nice test and it tells us, hey, this distribution compares favorably with your initial distribution. It doesn't tell you which one of these things is failing typically. You don't know, is it my dose or is it my distance to agreement. So this makes it a little bit difficult in evaluation, especially when you're trying to explain to physicians, what, what are you trying to tell me with respect to why we can't pass this plan? So an effective method of understanding this is to look at this test, this gamma test, which was really just a combination of the dose difference and DTA tests. Look at them in the extremes where you're setting one to zero or the other. So here in the low gradient region, here's our reference point. And you can see here, we have a very low uh, gradient, low dose gradient. The, this test defaults to the dose difference test. Steep dose gradient here with respect to it defaults to the distance to agreement test. This is by setting one to zero. So what does this mean? So if we look at the physical meaning of this and we say a gamma Remember, a gamma of one or less is good. A gamma greater than one is failure. So what does 1.5 mean for 3%, three millimeter threshold, 10%? Gamma 1.5 for 3%, three millimeter indicates that the low gradient region, the measured versus calculated pixels may differ by as much as four and a half percent or one and a half percent outside the set limits or four and a half millimeters or one and a half millimeter outside the limits. This gives us an example of this. In this case, I've used gamma 1.01. 1 
1.01 times 3, 3%, or 3 millimeters in this case, is 3.03 .03 minus the 3 that we set is we're 0.03 millimeters outside previously set limit. If we use a 1.5, we're one and a half outside. Nobody's going to fail a plan for 0.03 millimeters. This is insignificant, but we may fail a plan for 1.5 millimeters, depending on what is the how how close a critical structure is. So this allows us to look at not only are we failing, but by how much are we failing? So it may not be enough to just look at gamma failing. How much is it failing by? What is our gamma value? Your software should give you this. Actually, they want you to also evaluate the number of pixels of value that are failing at this level. If it, depending on how many were evaluated, if it's a very low percentage, it might not be significant. If you have a great deal of pixels, failing this may, may give you additional information about whether or not to treat this patient. So tolerance and action limits. <clears throat> They've helped us a great deal with this. They say tolerance limits are defined as the boundaries within which a process is considered to be operating normally and just subject to random errors only. If an IMRT QA measurement is outside a tolerance limit, but within an action limit, which we'll talk about in a minute, it's left up to the medical physicist to decide whether we should do something about it. Action limits are defined as the amount of quality measurements allowed to deviate without risking harm to the patients, okay? If we're outside an action limit, and these limits are set such that it could cause problems to the patient, then we should not use this. It could have a, ne a negative impact on the, on the patient. So this is how they have um, set this up for us and made suggestions with respect to what limits we should use. So they give us those recommendations. They let us know that the universal tolerance limits for everybody should be that the gamma passing rate should be greater than 95% using 3% two millimeter distance to agreement, 3% dose two millimeter distance to agreement, and a threshold of 10%. Action limit is the gamma rate should be greater than 90% for 3% two millimeters and a threshold. If the plan fails the action limit, right? You're supposed to evaluate the entire gamma distribution. If these points are in a bad area, we should not use the plan. I actually don't like this portion personally. I think we should look at action limit as being a sort of a no-fly no zone. We don't have enough information to base everything on this potentially single plane of irradiation. And if we're down at below 90%, 3%, 2 millimeters, there's potentially something further wrong with this plan. Our practice is not to use those, but this is a, a recommendation for the TG, the task group report. In either way, you're, you need to evaluate why this is having such a failure rate. They make recommendations for any case with gamma passing rate less than 100%. The gamma distribution should be carefully reviewed rather than the, relying on the distilled statistical evaluations. 95% passes or 93% passes. This may not be enough. Maybe we should look at how many, by how much is the gamma distribution failing and how many of the pixels are there that are failing. Review the results should not be limited to the percent of points that fail, but should also include other relative gamma values like the max, mean, min, median, anything that additional information that is given you with the software. Analyze the maximum gamma value and percent of points exceeding that value, as I, I've already said. And the IMR treatment process should be monitored and investigated if the gamma passing rate is systematically lower than tolerance limits. So once again, as you're evaluating, as you move forward with different complexities with respect to treatment sites, delivery methods, you should be evaluating this gamma passing rate. And even if they are passing, do we have a trend? But if they're lower than the tolerance limits, that means that, hey, we've exceeded what we've commissioned. So we need to make adjustment. The stati gamma statistics should be reviewed on a structure by structure basis if you can. We are unable to do this at this time at Fox Chase. Depending on the software that you may have or may not have or may be getting, you may be able to do this. And once again, track the gamma across known patients, uh, same type of patients, same tumor sites, uh, to look for systematic errors. 
So this is always a very good idea. Anytime you refer to a passing rate for gamma, you should say the dose difference, the distance to agreement, and the threshold. 3%, 2 millimeters, 10% threshold. This gives us enough information to make some further analysis. So let's speak a little bit about those types of measurements. Excuse me. The true composite method. This is a composite of all beams delivered through plan specific geometry. This is exactly how the patient's going to be treated. This is how I've always viewed that we should be doing this. If we're going to test it, let's put it, do the same thing that we're going to do to the patient. In this case, here you have an axial coronal distribution on the, the chamber array and the actual patient. One of the interesting things to look at here, and maybe it's just because I'm a little bit old school when it comes to this, this looks like this. Even though this patient's body habitus is not a cuboidal phantom, by doing this, we get a dose distribution that looks very much like what was planned. If I'm expecting a divot here, I get a divot here. If I'm expecting this ellipsoidal distribution, I get this ellipsoidal distribution. It makes me feel, I like to call it warm and fuzzies. It makes me feel like what we're trying to do with the patient is actually, I'm actually measuring. So I, I like this added level of comfort. There are advantages in this. The measurement includes any inaccuracies in the gantry, collimator couch angles, MLC leaf position, couch attenuation, everything like this. The, as I mentioned, the, the, the two look the same or look very similar. You get that warm and fuzzy feeling. And you only have one dose image to analyze per plane of interest. So these are all advantages. The disadvantage is that portions of the many beams may not traverse the detector. Not every part of the beam is sampled. So this can be an issue. Once again, when we begin these and then on any time we make changes, multi-plane analysis is, is a good idea. There is then the perpendicular field by field method where all the beams are delivered straight down. Override the gantry, deliver them straight down. It's very easy, right? And you end up with, in this case, five beams, five different distributions. The advantage, all parts of the field are sampled. The field by field analysis may reveal subtle errors and it prevents dose washout or one good area of, a one, of, of one beam being compensated for by a, or one bad area being compensated for a good area somewhere else. So you typically don't have that. Disadvantages, the analysis can be misleading. Let's say this one fails very poorly or doesn't do as well, but depending on how well the other four are doing, as well as what the overall weighting was here, this may lead us to delay or cancel a patient when it wasn't clinically significant. So that is one of the issues with this. And then clinical interpretation of the results is challenging because none of these look like anything that were related to that plan. So unless we're looking at on a beam by beam, it doesn't look like the target necessarily. It's just you don't get that warm and fuzzy. And then there's the simplest of all, and these were the composite of all of them delivered straight down. Here, they don't look anything alike. This one was not, doesn't look like this one at all. Advantages is all the portions of the beams are incorporated in a single image, but disadvantages, it can mask errors in certain areas, certainly in the scatter region. Dose errors from one beam within the composite may be obscured by the superposition of the others. And for VMAT, you lose things like dose rate variation versus gantry. Non-uniform dose rate issues can, are, are obscured. We are uh, not necessarily testing all the things that we, we need to. Normalization. They want us to do global normalization. This is typically described as a percentage of maximum dose for one or both of the dose distributions being compared. And the dose difference between any measured and calculated dose point pair is normalized using the same value for all points, often the max. Local is the dose difference for all point pairs is normalized to the planned dose at the local point. Allows one to have the same relative tolerance in the target and critical structures, but gives you unrealistic requirements in the low dose regions. TG218 requests that we do global, which we have always done. So, as far as the recommendations that they've given compared to what we do here, IMRT QA measurements should be performed using the true composite method. That's the same thing that the patient undergoes. We've always done this.
QA measurements should be performed using the perpendicular field by field method if for some reason you're unable to do true composite or for further verification when you have a true composite failure, you want to evaluate on a field by field basis. We've always done this. We should not use perpendicular composite at masks errors. We never did this. Analysis should be performed in absolute dose mode, not relative dose mode. I've already mentioned this multiple times, yes. And dose calibration method measurements should be performed before each measurement session to factor in variation in detector response and accelerator output. Yes, once again, we've went over this. Global normalizations used, we do this, and you should choose a point that is within 90% of the max value. We do this. And dose, thre dose threshold should be set to exclude low dose areas that have little or no clinical relevance. We do this. So what is this threshold concept, basically? It seems pretty simple, but let's assume for a second that we have an array that is 12 centimeters by 12 centimeters, and that each pixel within the array is a one square millimeter. So we have 14,400 square millimeters or, or pixels. If our entire 40, 400 pixel target is red, meaning they all failed, right? 400 divided by the total number is 2.8% are failing. So that means 97.2% are passing. So if we're only paying attention to the distilled number, this could be a passing plan when clearly the entire target is not what we wanted. If we eliminate some of these extraneous pixels, the ones that are not of any clinical significance, and I've just went down to six by six, where now we have 400 divided by 3,600, 11% failing or 89% passing, we're already below the um, action limit suggested by TG218. And it would at least force us to look at additional things. Why are we failing? So basically, this is what thresholding is. We have adopted 10% many years ago. This is what's ex what is recommended now. We have also looked at setting that threshold to whatever your lowest organ at risk tolerance is. So if it was, let's say the spinal cord at 50 gray, well, whatever 50 gray is with respect to the total, that percentage would be where we set the tolerance. We're, we're not we weren't interested in anything lower than that. So we, we've even in, uh, looked at this. But in general, they like us to look at 10%. But it is good to use this process to evaluate the high and low, low dose gradients, as I'll show you in a mo high and low dose regions for every case. And I'll show you that in a moment. Evaluating the strength of your IMRT Q QA program. I thought this was one of the more interesting things in TG218. They've given us a tool, a statistical tool, to allow us to see how we compare with universal limits, the acceptable limits that are thought to, by exceeding, we could cause um, harm to the patient. So they they give us this nice equation where it's the difference between, delta A is the difference between the upper and lower action limits, we have a target goal, a variance, a mean, we have a method to balance type one and type two statistical errors, and we, it utilizes an eye chart. Now, eye chart basically just takes our own data, you're gonna place your own data in this, and it defines the limits for you. If, then when you're evaluating your entire system, if the action limits for the process are determined that are significantly lower than the universal action limits, actions should be taken to improve your QA process. And they suggest you do this after 20 patients. When we looked at implementing this, I did it with 150 patients, 75 IMRT, 75 VMAT. I wanted to see how, this is a very busy slide once again, how we fare with what I would call a very robust tested process with what they're suggesting. Because we were looking at 3%, three millimeter distance agreement, 10% threshold. They want us to go to three and two, 3%, three two millimeters. So while I was there, I looked at 2%, two millimeter, 2%, one millimeter. Tighter and tighter and tighter criteria. How would our system hold up? And as you can see here, for 3%, three millimeter, we have no problem. These were all passing, no problem at all. The action limit they require is 95%. If we vary outside of 95%, if we're close, then we're okay, but further away from 95% for the action limit, we should look at. As you can see here, we have a, oh, 
uh, here we can see that we have close to a 90%, but a little bit off. So this has practical issues with respect to dropping to 3% two millimeters. That practical issue is this. If we have 1,700 external beam patients a year, 70% are IMRT or VMAT, we do QA the night before 40% of the time. If we fail an action limit, if we call this do not treat or no fly zone, two patients a month would need to be canceled. So this would have a direct impact because no, the patient's gonna be unhappy, the physician's gonna be unhappy, but at least it lets me see how strong our, how strong our process is. So we wanted to work on improving the delivery process, angular corrections, beam parameters potentially, alignment, plane selection, and avoid this night before radiation if at all possible, because if we cannot resolve the issues before the patient gets here, you may have to cancel them. So we decided to use this thresholding concept to use the SPC concept and look at only the action limits. 75 IMRT and VMAT broken apart at 3% two millimeters, you can see here for IMRT, our action limit is 82%. That's getting pretty far away from the 90% re required action limit for, or suggested action limit for the universal action limit. But we're almost 92% for VMAT. So this tells us our VMAT program is much stronger than our fixed beam IMRT program, which is interesting in that we use the same beam models. So you can see here that those fit lines diverge as a function of, plan of a decreasing or a tightening criteria. So what, the only thing that we could think of here that right out of the gate that we did differently is we apply, apply angular correction to the fixed beam where we don't apply it to the VMAT plans. So the idea here is, could that be an issue with angular correction or the way in which we apply it. And we found that yes, definitely it is, especially if we get smaller and smaller segments and depending on where those segments are. So this is an area that we've been working on. If we then cut out the lower 50%, we're just not even interested in zero to 50% dose and look at the target region primarily, 50% and above, you can see that the lines are almost parallel. Now, both are below the 90% line now, because we're not obscuring, this, obscuring everything with, that, with, with all the, the low-dose segments, or low-dose pixels, if you will. But this would tell us that we need to work on the IMRT a little bit more than the VMAT. So this is a nice tool where you can help evaluate and try to chase down how do I improve my, plan, or my planning and delivery system for IMRT QA analysis. So, the bottom line for all of this is, as I showed you earlier, how to explain to a physician that what does 3% three millimeter distance to agreement mean? And you have to look at it in the extremes, whether it's high gradient or low gradient region, this gets to be very um, arduous, if you will. So what we can do is we can look at this for a gamma of 3% two millimeters and look at the ones that failed. And this is the one fail that failed that and the VMAT out of the 75. So we took that plane of analysis, right? And we measured the point that overlies the spinal cord, one of the red areas. And the ratio between the measured versus calculated was 7% difference. Went back to the planning system for the same coordinates and saw that it initially had about 2,900 centigrade, scaled it by the 7%, 31 gray, well below cord tolerance, would not have caused an impact on this patient. These were, this was the assessment for all 150 cases. That was this one. Here were the others. The seven for the fixed beam were six lungs and one brain. Four of them involved spinal cord, the brain involves brain stem, and two of them were in the target region. So we looked at the exact same concept with all of them, and none of them would have been delayed based on the physicians, based on this analysis. Here you can see these last two cases, F and G. This first one is in the target region. That ratio is 0.9. We go to the same point and find it. And now it tells us by the time we propagate all the way through here, 
we planned 62 gray, we ended up with 57 gray, it's about 95%. Our practice is 95% of the PTV receives 100% of the treatments, the prescribed dose. Many protocols are 95% PTV, 95% of the treatment, prescribed treatment dose. So in this case, would not have delayed this case. For the other one, we were actually a little bit lower. Same process, working through this, find a ratio. We ended up being lower dose. The physician once again said, no, based on our PTV margins, we would not have changed, we would not have held this case up. So this process is very arduous. It takes a lot of time. You can't, usually not enough time to be doing this in the, right before treatment start during this it takes a little bit of time. So we have to have some metrics where we can say, yes, this plan's a go for today or this plan's not a go for today. Eventually, or it's already available where we can do this in an automated fashion, as I showed earlier. And this is what we're trying to go to. So that method that I just showed you along this progression is where we currently are. It's our best attempt at doing this without the software. So once I can convince the administrators that I would like the software to do this, then we will utilize the log files or the EPID distributions and recalculate the dose. We'll have to get the physicians involved and then we will, for, for certainly for non-standard non things, and we'll be able to base these on more clinical results, if you will, more clinical correlation. So I think this is probably about the best we're going to be able to get to eventually. Any of these methods work, and especially for those of you that are just starting, we've done all of these over the years. This is where we're trying to get to now. So when we implemented, should we implement, that's what we thought, the action limits. But we were at 3%, 3 millimeters, 95% passing rate versus 3%, 2 millimeters, 10% threshold and 90% passing rate. Why should we do this? We're already doing this. We already evaluate values under 90%, we are 95%, even pattern deviations greater than 95%. But we decided we would want to do it. We will learn. We would need to relearn what to expect. Although this study could be used as a bridge, we wanted to know how how what we're going to be looking for now that we drop to three percent two millimeter ten percent threshold. There there may be some reasonable information when looking at gammas of one point five, and how many pixels are at this degree of failure, where they are, but they do typically represent the worst case scenario. So what we decided, our considerations were we would record both, 3% 3 millimeters, 3% 2 millimeters. Now when I review these every morning, I start out with 5% 3 millimeters, and I just want to see if everything, what's the total magnitude of the error? How much of the distribution is red, how much of it is blue. Then I drop to 3%, 3 millimeters, 3%, 2 millimeters, and I look at a 50% threshold, looking at just the target region. And then I go back and report these two. So that's how we're keep that's how we're trying to learn what this decreased criteria means, especially when for 150 patients we did not find any clinical correlation with those failures. They do find big errors, as you saw um, with respect to the two examples that we've given, but nothing that would cause us to have, none, none of the small ones like this that would have caused us issues with patients. So we're still learning as everyone else. For gamma 1.5 1, or greater, we are greater than 1.5. I evaluate the number of pixels that correlate with the planning CT and where we write a special physics consult for this. And for night before QA, or night before starts, so when we're doing the QA, let's say tonight, for plans that start tomorrow, if, as long as they're moderately failing, nothing bad, nothing jumping off the table at us, we do not postpone the treatment for those moderately failing ones, for conventional fractionated IMRT or VMAT. The reason being, we have many fractions, we can always, if it's not failing very much, like let's say it's, 89, you're supposed to be 90. If I don't see anything really crazy, then we could let that patient go and we can try to do additional planes, maybe it was some, search something out. If it's SBRT, since we only have five or fewer fractions, we do postpone. So, because we can't recover from those types of errors in general. 
So this is how we've chosen to adopt TG218, which I think is an excellent uh, guide for us, but we do need to understand all the idiosyncrasies of it and what they physically mean. Does your system exhibit the same kind of issues that they've seen? In some cases, ours does. In some cases, it does not. Like the one where I showed that we don't see failure as a function of plan complexity. So if that's all I think we have, we went a little bit over the hour, but there's, I think there's a great deal of information there for you. I tried to annotate the slides a lot so that you could get a lot of information from them. And we will be having a, a question and answer type of interaction thing, I believe Thursday, and be happy to answer any questions. So thank you for your attention. Great, and thank you, Dr. Price. This was a, a really excellent and comprehensive uh, review of our QA processes. And so I know there's a lot of information, as you mentioned, so we'll be posting these PowerPoint slides to the shared, shared folder in the next day or so if they're not already there, as well as the, the, up, the upload of this, of this video file. And so this is a good time to open it up for questions related to specific topics or, or slides that Dr. Price presented. Otherwise, on Thursday, again, we're going to have a few physicists, lecturers, educators from this course here to kind of do more of a roundtable to talk about your specific QA workflows, issues that you're having, questions you may be having about switching to different methods of, of QA, things like that. So we'll, we'll save those type of things for Thursday, but any questions for now? All right. It looks like it looks like everybody understood everything from your talk, Dr. Price. Okay. That's good. I, I know it's a, it's a long talk. It's a long talk. So um, it is. I'm, it is a lot of information. Things. Great. Well, thank you again for everyone uh, to everyone for attending, and we'll we'll see you on Thursday. Take care and have a good night. Bye. -bye.